Tribe, everybody. Welcome to our flock talk today. Um, please feel free to join us. Uh, I'm Dr. Patrick Biggs. I'm with Priya Animal Nutrition. I'm here today. We're going to spend the next, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, hopefully talking about chickens and kind of what it's going to take to get you started with, um, you know, th those baby birds that you're going to start seeing in the stores here in, in the upcoming weeks. So, for those of you that are thinking about getting started with birds, this is a great place to start. We're going to talk about all of those things that uh, you're going to need to know, I'll give you kind of a, a brief introduction to everything you're going to need to know. And then we've got some links at the end where you can go to our website and obviously get some more details, download some uh, more in-depth details of how to raise those chickens. But uh, for now, let's let's dive into this, why we're, why we're getting chickens. So, um, um, you know, We've got comment section in here. I'm watching to see, so post where you're at. Anything you want to tell us about your chickens, how many chickens you have, how many years you've had chickens, whatever you feel you want to share with us, post that in there. Um, you know, I see we've got Stephen Wright in Topeka, Kansas. April East is tuning in from Pennsylvania. We've got Angie Schaefer from Wentzville, Missouri. Uh, you know, lots of people already in here, so um, keep those coming in. Uh, we are going to have some quizzes some pop quizzes during there where we're going to um, offer up some prizes throughout the presentation. So stay tuned for those. We're going to first person to get the answer in the comment section. Uh, we'll announce the winner and then we'll get in touch with you and get you some, um, some free stuff for that. So, <clears throat> um, all right, let's dive into this. So getting started. So one of the first things you need to think about is, you know, first off, can you actually have chickens where you're at? So it's always a good rule of thumb to kind of check what the local rules are in your area, what uh, maybe lo the local ordinances might be. Um, you know, if you live in a homeowners association or property owners association, make sure that it's okay uh, for you to have chickens in your space, because we certainly don't want you to go through all of the, the hassle of getting all of the equipment that you're going to need for your chickens and then find out that it's not actually legal for you to have chickens where you live. So um, that's one of the first steps we want to do. And then it's kind of the next thing you want to think about is how much space are you really going to need um, for those chickens? Uh, we, we like to say it's about 10 square feet per bird is really what those birds are going to need. And we're going to divide that up into kind of really two different parts of that coop. So, you know, we, we, I say coop and then really that kind of encompasses both the building structure that you can see here and then that outdoor run area. Uh, you know, ultimately it's about 10 square feet total for, for those birds, but uh, we, we divide it up into, you know, the run area where we like to give them a little bit more room out there, seven to eight square feet. You know, you can obviously go more, just think the more space that you give them, uh, you, you know, you need to kind of fence that in and keep them safe because predators can be a big problem for your birds. Uh, and so as you, that run area gets bigger, there's certainly more costs associated with fencing that in and keeping your birds safe. Uh, you know, having chicken wire there along the outside walls to kind of help keep things in. We don't want to use chicken or chicken wire. We want to use um, barbed wire, barbed wire, not barbed wire. Don't use barbed wire, welded wire, hardware cloth, uh, something that's smaller and stronger. Chicken wire is great for keeping chickens where you want them, but it's not really great for keeping everything else out of there. Chicken wire is actually pretty soft um, and pliable. And so raccoons and foxes and that they get in there and they can kind of work those openings large enough where they can reach, uh, especially with raccoons, they reach their paws in there and they can latch onto a chicken. Uh, and, and then that's not all that great. And then, you know, as you put that welded wire, that hardware cloth in there to keep those birds safe, you know, it's always a good idea to bury that wire in the ground about six inches deep and then run it out parallel to the ground about another 12 inches. That's going to keep most things from um, trying to dig in there, uh, tunnel underneath it, um, and that. And so um, I, I see we've got some more people joining us. We got like that Karen from Chile, Minnesota. I like that. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that you're going to find, especially if you live in a cold weather environment, is having that roof over your run area is also going to be beneficial because that's going to keep the snow um, out of the coop area, out of the run area for the birds, so keep them a little drier hopefully a little less snow inside that run area for the birds. And then obviously for everyone else, you know, if it's raining, uh, you know, that's going to provide some shelter when it, when it gets to that point. Now, run area kind of, you know, as big as you want to go with that, 
Uh, when it actually comes to the coop, we want to keep that actually pretty small. About two to three square feet per chicken is what I really recommend in there. Um, and we do that for really for, for getting your birds to be able to tolerate the cold weather. Um, you know, keeping that space nice and small is going to, you know, those birds are actually little heat generators. Their body temperature is 106 to 108 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we size that coop appropriately, that building structure, um, the birds actually, while they're in there at night, kind of sleeping, resting, doing whatever, um, they'll actually generate enough body heat in there to kind of raise the temperature inside of that coop area to actually make it a little warmer for the birds and a little more comfortable, uh, you know, when it might be in those, you know, below freezing temperatures that like some most of us are experiencing right now. Um, you know, keep that nice and small because if we do make it nice and expansive, the problem is those birds don't aren't able to generate enough body heat and warm up that environment. And so uh, that tends to make that area a little colder and just makes it a little more challenging for those birds to tolerate those cold temperatures uh, when it comes to the winter months. So I know we like to spoil our birds and give them lots of space, but this is actually one where keeping that space relatively small for the birds is actually gonna be more beneficial for them uh, in the long run. And ultimately keeping that coop area small that space small, it kind of encourages the birds to spend more time outside in that run area. And that's where we want to encourage them to spend more time. You know, ideally they use that coop to maybe come in, they sleep at night, or that's where they're going to lay their eggs. We don't want them spending a whole lot of extra time in there because they're going to make messes and we want to keep those eggs as clean as possible. So if we can encourage the birds to stay outside in the run area, um, that's more the better um, for your eggs uh, and, and everything else that you've got going in there. So Again, keep that coop area run, coop area small, two to three square feet per bird. Let that run area um, do most of the work for you. <clears throat> so, all right, um, that's kind of that's what we need for space. Uh, let's kind of that's really what you need to think about before you get started. Let's kind of start diving into um, the brooder, kind of what you're going to need to get started with these birds. You know, as you go to the store, here's a list of things that you <clears throat> you might need. Um, to get. Uh, and two, I would encourage you to, um, you know, gather up most of these things, if not all of these things, before you actually get the birds and bring them home. So get all the equipment that you need, get the, you know, your heat source, your litter, your shavings, uh, a place to keep the birds, the feeders, the waters, all of those um, <clears throat> things in there um, before you get going and get set up. I see we have a question here from Lori. Uh, what is the coop and run floor you use? <clears throat> so um, our floor is a solid floor. Um, I think we have a linoleum base over the top of it just to ease with cleaning. Uh, and then in the coop area in the actual building, we actually we put pine shavings in there to kind of help uh, with the birds and kind of help with some of that mess. Um, out in the run area, we kind of let that be. We use at Purina, we have a research farm where we have um, 12 coops full of chickens in there. And we actually use um, gravel in our <clears throat> run area. Uh, that helps to kind of let some water drain through so it keeps a little cleaner um, and it gives something for the birds to dig through. But you know, the outdoor area, whatever you put in there, it may be grass day one, but within a couple of weeks of those birds being out there, that grass is gonna be gone as the birds dig through it, go to the bathroom on it and, and so on and do everything that the birds are gonna do out there. But inside that coop area, uh, kind of always think about that's one where you're going to do a little more cleaning. So kind of think of what you can put in there that can tolerate maybe some water, maybe some sanitizing solutions, things of that nature. So, um, you know, like I said, we've got like a plastic linoleum type base that we can hose down and, and wipe out. And then we put uh, pine shavings over the top of that. <clears throat> so, all right, now let's get back to with your chicks and getting started. So the first thing you're going to do when you bring those birds home, we, we're going to keep them in kind of what we refer to as a brooder area. Um, this is really kind of a smaller space that uh, you're going to be able to control the environment a little more. We're not going to put them outside um, just yet uh, because we want to be able to keep those birds nice and warm. That's really a big thing for these birds. So you're going to start out with your brooder area. And oftentimes we're thinking something that's round shaped. Um, I saw somebody posted that they were using a playpen, Tiffany posted that she uses a playpen for her birder when her chicks got going. Um, there's lots of different things out there that you can use. Um, we use, you know, if you want to go kind of old fashioned, low scale, 
Um, we have cardboard rings that we use. They just put them out there in this nice ring. Some people will use like a kid's swimming pool, like those little swimming pools. They're, they're not very deep, they're round. We do like that round shape for the birds. Um, you do have, you can run into some issues with your birds if they do have 90 degree corners, especially if you have a lot of birds. Uh, you know, the birds, they get frightened, they run, and when they run into a corner, they tend to stop. But then all of those birds run into that same corner, and eventually you get a pile of chickens in that corner. And it doesn't take very long for the bird on the bottom of that pile to overheat, suffocate, and ultimately die. So having those round brooder areas or you know if you have something that's got corners in it put a piece of cardboard in there to kind of soften up that corner so that they do get frightened they just kind of keep running in a circle and you're going to have less issues with those birds kind of getting stuck in a corner um and that so um it's not a common occurrence but it's certainly an easy one to prevent so just keep that in mind as you're kind of putting together your brooder space um and then you don't need a whole lot of space for those birds initially um you know it's only one or two square feet for those birds per bird as you bring them in and get them going. As they grow, you're going to expand that space as your chickens start to grow. But uh, you can certainly use uh, a round, <clears throat> um, something nice and small, keep everything contained. So in that brooder area, you're going to have food, you're going to have water, you're going to have a heat source, uh, hopefully a thermometer, the bedding material in there, all of those things um, to go. And, and so as you can see here, we've got um, Temperature is really important for those young birds. Um, you know, those birds, you know, they're cute, they're fluffy, they're adorable when you first get them, you know, when they're day old, two days old, whatever it is. But those feathers that they have just aren't great for keeping their body temperature up. So we've got to provide an external source of heat for those birds. Now, there are a couple of options. Well, there, there are several options for the, keeping your birds warm. Um, you know, traditionally a, a heat lamp, which is, you know, just a 250 watt light bulb. Um, it's hung over the top. It's an incandescent bulb that puts off a lot of heat. <clears throat> That's traditionally what has been used for a heat source for your birds. Uh, you know, people like that because it, it's relatively inexpensive. However, I want to warn you that there is certainly a risk of starting a fire with that because you remember you've got a 250 watt light bulb that gets very hot and most of the time we're dangling that over um, a pile of wood shavings which are quite flammable and so every now and then whatever we rig to hold that light over that brooder area falls um, it starts a fire and then it just gets worse from there um, you do have birds that are jumping around they're full of dander the things are going everywhere so there's always a risk of fire with that one so um, <clears throat> now I would certainly encourage you to um, if you are going to use one of those incandescent light bulbs those 250 watt heat lamps be as safe as possible as you can with those because we certainly don't want you um, you know starting a fire in there killing those chickens and possibly even burning down your house or or even uh, worse than just the chickens um, ending up dead in, in that scenario. So there are other options that are a little safer. They're a little more expensive, but depending on kind of your risk management situation, uh, they are electric style heaters. They plug in their platforms. They plug in the birds can go underneath at the top or I guess the underside of that heater gets warm. So the birds can go in there. Um, they can warm up underneath there. And typically those heaters will um, they are adjustable. So as your birds get bigger, get taller, you can raise that up and use it for a longer period of time. So, um, you know, those are a little more expensive. Your heat lamp is probably in the 20 to $30 range, whereas those electric style heaters, probably in the 60 to hundred dollar range. And depending on what kind of accessories you want to go along with that, uh, it, it certainly, the price can certainly go up. But they are, those electric style heaters are much safer, they're much more efficient. So, you know, you, you gotta decide what works best for you um, <clears throat> um, in there. And, and certainly less risk of starting a fire with those radiant style heaters. And, and those are certainly uh, the ones that I, I would encourage you to go with um, if, if that works for you. Uh, let's see, and then, you know, back to the temperature. So we're gonna start out 95 degrees is really that target temperature. Uh, when we get started with those birds, nice and warm. And then every week we can drop that temperature about five degrees until the birds are around six weeks old. At six weeks of age, the birds are fully feathered and now they can start to tolerate colder temperatures. 
uh, and we can start thinking about moving them outside and into their coop. Um, but ultimately, you know, <clears throat> use that temperature guide as just that, as a guide. Ultimately, listen to the chicks and really let them tell you what the temperature needs to be uh, in, in that brooder area. So uh, let's see if we can make that slide just a little bit bigger again. We'll uh, see that, um, you know, listen, look at the birds, you know, kind of see what they're, if you find that all of the birds are spread out as far as possible from your heat source or, um, you know, if you're using that heat lamp or if nobody is going underneath that uh, radiant style heater, it's probably too hot. So we need to figure out how to cool it down a little bit so that those birds can go in there. Um, if you have all of your birds crowded under your heat source, it's too cold. So now we need to figure out how to warm up that environment. Uh, for those birds so that they're a little more comfortable. If you find that all of your birds are kind of gathered in one portion of the brooder area, there's probably a draft blowing through there. So there's a breeze that's kind of a chilling effect. So they're all trying to stay away from that. And then they're all huddling up to stay warm um, in that area. Ultimately, what you want to see is your birds kind of spread out all over the place. You'll see some of them will be under the heat source, some of them be out eating, they'll be out drinking, you know, they'll be out doing everything that uh, chickens do um <clears throat> on a regular basis now uh in that brooder area with that heat source you're also that's where you want to put the food in the water so you're going to start out with the food in the water low to the ground um, when those birds first get in there but as those birds age they start to grow they're going to get taller you can start to raise those feeders and waters up higher so if you're using um like gravity style feeders they should be at about chest height for the birds whether it's for the feed or water if you want to think about using nipple waters, which are going to be much cleaner, much drier, um, you know, those you're going to put at probably about head height for the birds. You actually want them to be raised up a little higher so that, you know, if the nipple is here, the bird has to kind of reach up to peck at it. So um, it doesn't need to be real low. We don't need the nipple down here and that bird's head way up here. So we want it up. We want the bird to reach for that. So those are some options. Uh, if you are using gravity style waters, just make sure there's covers on that and, and for the feeders put covers on them because the birds are going to get in that stuff they're going to play in it they're going to go to the bathroom in it they're going to make a mess of those feeders if they can get inside of them so most of the feeders and waters out there do have um, kind of rings that go around them that kind of little holes to kind of keep the birds heads from you know just so that they can get their head in there um, and and not their whole body so <clears throat> there's lots of different options for you to do but plenty of food, plenty of water in there for the birds. We don't want them to have to go looking for food. And you kind of want them to a point where they just kind of turn around and there's food or there's water. Uh, you know, it's, it's important that we get the right nutrition in these birds um, as quickly as possible because they do grow very fast. And so we want every opportunity for those birds to eat and drink and get the nutrition that they need so that they can grow up to be great um, <clears throat> egg layers um, moving forward. All right, oh, what do we have next? <clears throat> so we need to think about, oh, here we go. Well, I don't think we're quite ready for the pop quiz. I forgot to talk about, I, I briefly talked about moving to, moving to a coop. Um, and I wanna talk about kind of making that transition from that brooder area out into the coop. So it's a bit tricky because it's somewhat situational. It depends on whether you already have chickens out in a coop or not. If the coop is empty, six weeks of eggs, that's when you can start making that transition out to the coop. So like I said, at six weeks of age, your birds are fully feathered. They can start tolerating temperatures down into that 30 and 40 degree range. So if it is that cold and you're starting to move those birds out there, um, that's kind of what we want the evening temperature to be. Uh, we don't want it to be 30 or 40 during the day and then at night it drops to you know 20 or, or even colder um, you know we need to give those birds some time to adapt to that colder environment because if we have been keeping them say in a garage or a basement where the temperature is a little more moderated and they've been in that 70 degree environment taking them and throwing them into that 30 degree temperature is going to be a bit of a shock to them so if we can kind of transition them to um, that cooler environment maybe you know, for a week, kind of take away that temperature, take away that heat source in maybe the garage or the basement so that the temperature does start to drop a little bit. The birds get a little more used to that colder temperature. You can start moving them outside uh, and, and not have too much to worry about those birds. They will tolerate that, those colder temperatures at six weeks of age. Now, 
Six weeks, that's if the coop is empty. Now, if you already have a flock of chickens, we're gonna have to do some, some work here to make sure that everything, that the environment, the situation is gonna be safe for those young birds. Cause we don't want to take six weeks, six week old chickens and toss them into a coop with, you know, your one, two, three year old laying hen, because you're gonna find that your older birds, the larger birds aren't gonna be so fond of those young um, baby birds that you've just thrown in there. <clears throat> you're gonna find chickens aren't necessarily nice to other chickens. Um, so, and, and they do have complexes. So the bigger ones will tend to pick on the little ones until the little ones no longer bother them, which unfortunately means that the little ones are now dead. Uh, and, and obviously that's not a situation we want to get in. So we need to wait until those birds are 16 weeks old before we start combining them. We've got a few reasons for that. Um, you know, first, one is, you know, you've got aggression. Like I just said, those older birds, those larger birds may not necessarily enjoy those younger, littler birds being in there. Uh, and so aggression can be an issue. Secondly, you've got food can be an issue. Um, your older birds are on layer feed, which is a much different nutrient profile than what those young birds are. You know, those young birds are still going to be on a starter feed. So we need to make sure we're getting the right feed into them. And layer feed has lots of calcium in it for eggshell production. And these young birds aren't ready for all of that calcium in their diet yet. So we need to wait a little longer um, <clears throat> for those young birds to kind of grow up um, and, and get to a point where they can tolerate starting to eat some of that layer feed. So uh, at 16 weeks of age, that's when you can start making that transition to join, combine those two flocks of birds. You know, those those 16 week old birds are gonna be roughly full size. So they're gonna be better able to deal with um, those older hens if there is a, an aggression issue. Uh, and, and I see Lori here is pointing out that there is definitely a pecking order and that is certainly the case. You are going to have a pecking order um, in that coop. So as you add more birds to that coop, you're gonna disrupt that pecking order. There's gonna be some fighting in there as the birds kind of settle into their new pecking order. So at 16 weeks of age, those young birds are roughly the same size. They're a little able to deal with um, those older birds. And then at 16 weeks of age, you can start to make that transition from the starter feed to a layer feed uh, without too much long-term um, impacts on those birds. You know, if we start doing that too soon, all that extra calcium is gonna have a negative impact on the bird's kidneys which can be problematic later in life. So at 16 weeks of age, they're starting to make that transition from a young bird that isn't laying eggs to a bird that is going to be laying eggs and it's soon. So by making that transition, the you know, body stores of, uh, they have places in their bones where they can start to store calcium. Those start to open up so they can start to eat the, that higher calcium feed and they'll start to build up those body stores of calcium. So at 18 weeks of age, when they do hit that point, they will, be ready to go for, for egg production. And, and then finally, the, you know, kind of the last real reason, which I think everybody's probably on top of right now is disease transmission. Those older birds have been around a lot longer. They've been exposed to more things. You know, they may be carrying diseases that they don't show signs of, but they can certainly pass on to those younger birds. And um, at six weeks of age, you know, those young birds, their immune systems aren't fully functional yet. And so by waiting until those older birds, those younger birds are 16 weeks of age, you know, that gives them more time for the, that immune system to start to develop. The birds aren't growing and developing because, you know, if we expose them to a disease uh, at six weeks of age, you know, they have to really stop growing at that point and fight off that disease, that challenge for their body. So they're not growing, they're not developing properly. And that's really key for those birds. So at 16 weeks, they're not growing, they're not developing nearly as fast as they were at six weeks of age. So their bodies are better able to deal with those challenges at that point. So really, you know, obviously you have to do what's best for your own situation because not everybody has a place that they can keep, um, you know, young chickens, pullets for up to 16 weeks before moving them. And, and maybe you don't have two coops where you can do that thing. So do what's best, but realize the longer that you can wait to combine those flocks, um, the more success that you're going to have um, for those. And then, you know, doing that integration, uh, I, I see April East here is saying, you know, it took her several weeks to really integrate. Um, you know, there's lots of ways that people go about kind of combining those birds. You know, oftentimes people use kind of like a, a dog crate, dog kennel, something where they can put maybe those newer birds inside that crate and then set that around 
um, maybe inside the coop or the run of the older birds so that everybody can kind of check each other out, get to know each other, um, and still have that fence barrier so that nobody gets overly aggressive and nobody gets picked on. So, you know, there's lots of steps of taking, you know, what's the best way to kind of combine those two groups, um, you know, taking time and it's vigilance on, on your part and just making sure that nobody's being too aggressive, no one's getting overly picked on and stepping in uh, when you see somebody getting kind of beat up on and, and kind of breaking that up so that it is, um, <clears throat> um, you know, less of a problem that everybody gets along. So that is certainly something to think about as you start combining those those birds. All right, now I think we have a quiz question coming up. So pop quiz here. Again, it's going to be the first comment that we see in, in the comment section that's going to be the winner. So when should you move your baby birds into an empty coop? All right, I'll give you a second. We just talked about it. So this is an empty coop. There are no older chickens in there. I realize it's a bit situational. Post your comments. Post your answer in the comments section. Oh, there we go. I see some answers. All right. My person in the back is, is going to keep that. I think I see who the winner is. Let's see who she thinks the winner is. Yes, there it is. April East got the first one. So great job, everyone. I see lots of right answers in here. Um, lots of six weeks. So guys, great job paying attention. Hopefully you learn from that. And, and, you know, I see some of you posted 16 weeks in here. So <clears throat> it's a bit confusing because, you know, 16 weeks is really that's when it's recommended for if you already have an older flock of hens um, in that coop. So anytime between, if the coop is empty, I'd say anytime between six and 16 weeks, that's when you can start making that transition out into the coop uh, if, you, if it's empty. If there are birds out there, 16 weeks is really the best time to kind of start that integration um, with those flocks. So great job, everyone. Um, let's see what we've got next. We're gonna dive into, now that's getting started, <clears throat> talked about what it takes to kind of brood them, to raise them, kind of the things that we need to think about. Now we need to get into what we need to food, feed them uh, for that because, you know, ultimately these are very important for these birds because these birds grow so fast. And what we're asking these birds to do for us ultimately is at some point we're going to ask them to lay an egg almost every day for the next several years of their lives. So we need to make sure that we build the foundation of the chicken properly. You know, we've got to, she needs to grow at the proper rate, not too fast, not too slow, kind of that Goldilocks mentality of just right. And that's what the feed is designed to do. It's intended to get that bird from hatch to 18 weeks and hit that target body size so that she's ready to go and lay eggs. So chickens grow really fast. Uh, laying chickens, uh, they double in body size during the first couple of weeks or in the first week, just in the first week, they double in body size from hatch. Um, by the time they're four weeks old, they're about four times uh, four to seven times their body size at hatch. So they grow really fast. So it's important that we get the right feed and the right nutrition into those birds as quickly as possible. Um, any day that those birds are not, don't have feed in front of them, and, and sometimes even hours that they don't have feed in front of them, can have a negative impact on their long-term growth and development. So we have to think there are 38 different nutrients that animals need on a daily basis to get, you know, to grow and develop properly. And that's what the feed is intended to do. You know, we, we're trying to make feeding your chickens the simplest part of kind of raising chickens, um, you know, where you don't have to do any work. All you have to do is make sure that that feeder is full. You know, chickens aren't meal eaters, they are grazers. So if you're out there looking for types of feeders, you're gonna find feeders that hold 20, 30, 50 pounds of feed at a time. Because the goal here is we just put the feed in the feeder and then the birds will kind of self-regulate. Um, birds are very good at not overeating. They're going to eat to meet nutrient requirements. So they're not going to gorge themselves uh, on feed. So we can put out 50 pounds of feed for three or four chickens, and those birds will eat that over a period of time. They're not going to overeat. They're going to eat to meet those requirements. So that's one big advantage of having those, those birds. So, um, you know, we've got some options when it comes to feed. But, you know, the things that you're looking for, you know, we're looking for 18% protein, you know, 1% calcium, one and a quarter percent calcium, you know, all of those things that you see here on the slide, you know, it's the amino acids, 
the vitamins, the minerals, the calcium, phosphorus, all of those things are, are vital to getting those birds to grow properly. And that's what the feed um, has in it. You know, it's formulated to meet all of those nutrient requirements, much different than the way that we eat, where we eat a variety of things because we don't always get enough vitamin A or manganese or you know lysine some of the amino acids we eat a variety of diets because one we don't like to eat the same thing every day and we don't eat a complete and balanced diet on a daily basis with every meal <clears throat> this food this chicken feed has all of the nutrients in it so i know for some of you out there who think your chickens are people um you're certainly entitled to that opinion i, I don't want to berate you or make you feel bad about that because that is certainly um you are entitled to do that. Um, but keep in mind that your chickens aren't humans. They don't have that kind of emotional attachment that we have to kind of, you know, we don't want to eat the same thing every day because we get bored. We want a variety. Chickens, animals don't necessarily have that same attachment to food. Um, <clears throat> you know, they just want to get the nutrients today that gets them tomorrow. And then when they get to that adult stage, what allows them to kind of reproduce lay eggs and provide for the next generation. So they don't necessarily care that they're eating the same thing every day. Um, so um, I don't think I said that all that well. And so I'm sorry if I offended somebody in there about how you feel about your chickens. Um, that was not my intention, but um, keep in mind, you know, we, we do often joke that there are chicken parents and chicken owners. You know, the chicken parents are the ones that are, you know, naming their chickens. You know, if it gets too cold, they bring them inside. Um, you know, they're, they're all of these things. The chickens are part of your family um, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. And then we have the other people that are kind of their chickens are chickens, like they're livestock, you know, they're outside. If they stop providing the eggs, yeah, yeah, maybe that chicken doesn't make it till tomorrow. You know, everybody has their own opinion on how the chicken should be treated. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, I'm not here to tell you whether you're right or wrong. Uh, Lauren asking about table scraps. Now, Lauren, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but we can certainly address this here for your young birds. Um, those chicks um, from about the first 18 weeks of life, I would recommend just letting them eat the complete feed. That's going to get them the best growth, the best development so that when they get to 18 weeks and get to that laying stage, uh, you know, they're going to be good egg layers. And then you can start to spoil them with some of those table scraps, but still, Anything that we're providing that's not part of the feed, we want to do in moderation. Just like you or I might like to eat, you know, a big bag of potato chips or a gallon of ice cream or whatever your, your vice might be. That's delicious, but it's not nutritious. So um, the feed has all of the nutrition that the birds need. So we want to limit how much we extra stuff we add so that we don't dilute the nutrition too much so that she's not getting the nutrition that she needs to uh, be healthy, be productive. Uh, to grow and develop and, and so on and so forth. So we, we like to follow a 90-10 rule when it comes to table scraps and other treats. So 90% of our daily intake should come from uh, the complete feed. The other 10% can come from things like table scraps or scratch grains, mealworms, or whatever those treats might be. Now, to put that into a little bit of perspective, because 90-10 probably doesn't mean much to anybody, because how much does a chicken actually eat? You know, adult birds are going to eat about a quarter pound of feed a day. So 10% of that is about 0 0.25. Well, it's not about, it is 0 0.25 pounds, which is roughly two tablespoons of kind of other things per bird per day. So it's really small amount. And then if you start looking at how much a young chicken is eating, so an adult bird is only eating a quarter pound of feed a day. If we back that down to what, say, you know, four or five, six weeks old, six week old chicken, you know, they're eating 30, 40 grams a day. You know, it's even smaller amount. So it gets even uh, lower than that. So again, you can spoil your birds with those things, but just do it in moderation. <clears throat> All right. Uh, the starting feed that we have, <clears throat> um, I got to get going here. I'm getting behind. <laughs> um, we've got a traditional feed, start and grow. That's available in medicated and non-medicated. And then if you want your birds to be raised on organic feed, we have an organic starter grower that you can feed to those birds. So regardless of which of those three options you're going to choose, the nutrition is the same. It's the 18% calcium. It's the uh, one to one and a quarter percent 
or 18% protein, one to one and quarter percent calcium, the vitamins and minerals, the nutrition, all of those nutrients that your birds need are going to be the same in all three of those options. There are just some subtle differences between those. Obviously, if you want to raise organic chickens, you need to feed the organic feed. So that would be the path to take. If you're not raising organic chickens, uh, start and grow either in the medicated or the non-medicated feed is really the option to go with. Now, the medication, and take a couple minutes just to explain the medication in here. Um, you know, the medication is called amprolium, which is a coccidiostat. It's not an antibiotic. So if you're concerned about feeding antibiotics to your birds, none of the Purina feeds have antibiotics in them. Uh, the medicated start and grow has amprolium. Like I said, it's a coccidiostat, which is an, an internal parasite that the birds can pick up from the ground. Uh, and, and some of those um, parasites can actually be pretty harmful to the birds. They can do a lot of bit of, a lot of damage to the intestines, the digestive tract of those chickens. And in some cases, those protozoal parasites can actually lead to the death of your chicken. So that medication is there to keep that parasite from becoming a problem, allowing your birds to grow and develop properly um, as they go. Now, choosing whether you go with medicated or non-medicated is ultimately kind of a personal choice but it's also whether or not um, your birds have been vaccinated. That's really kind of the driving point here. If your birds have been vaccinated for coccidiosis, uh, then you can feed them the non-medicated feed. That vaccination will actually um, keep those birds, they'll develop a natural immunity to coccidiosis and then that will keep them um, safe uh, for the most part from most outbreaks of, of coccidiosis. Now, um, if your birds weren't vaccinated for coccidiosis, now, I, I guess I want to back up just a second and, and clarify, too, that most birds should be vaccinated for Marek's disease. So you need to ask when you buy your birds if they've been vaccinated for coccidiosis. Just asking if they've been vaccinated doesn't give you enough information because most of the birds should have been vaccinated for Marek's disease, which is a separate disease um, that the feed has nothing to do with. Um, <clears throat> so, but the vaccination is something that you can get typically you're going to get that if you're buying your birds directly from a hatchery the majority of the stores that you're buying your birds from um, are not going to be vaccinating their those birds for coccidiosis because it is um, an additional fee to that and uh you know so it, it's it's something to keep in mind so you know if you're unsure of the vaccination status of your birds um, feeding them the medicated feed is going to keep them the safest um, so, um, coccidia, that's the parasite that affects your birds is a very difficult parasite to get rid of. So once it's in your flock, any new birds that you bring in are, are going to be susceptible to coccidiosis moving forward. So it, it's, you can't, it's very difficult to get rid of in order to kind of claim that your area is free of coccidiosis. You have to actually leave it free of birds for about seven years, um, uh, before that, um, parasite will actually disappear from the environment because it lives in the soil. The birds pick it up from the soil, they eat it, the parasite reproduces inside the bird, and then the eggs come out, and then it just the cycle repeats. So that medication is going to keep those birds safe. Um, and then once you start feeding the medicated feed to your birds, you need to keep feeding it to your birds until they are 18 weeks old to make that transition to layer feed. Um, the, the medication doesn't impart any sort of immunity to the disease, to the, that parasite. So if you feed it for four or six weeks and then switch them to the non-medicated feed, they're going to be susceptible to coccidiosis at, at once you take them off that feed. So in order to protect the birds, you've got to keep feeding them that medication um, there. So if you know that you've had an outbreak of coccidiosis in the past, realize you either need to bring vaccinated birds in or continue to feed medicated feed until you make that transition. The birds will develop a natural immunity to coccidiosis. Uh, we're just kind of delaying when that is going to be. We don't want them, you know, the, like I said, those birds grow really fast in those first, you know, six to 18 weeks. You know, we want those birds to grow and develop properly. Again, if at four or five weeks they develop a disease challenge with coccidia, now they're not growing, they're not developing. You know, the nutrients that they're not, they're taking in aren't being absorbed as well, so they're not growing and developing properly. If we keep them on that medicated feed, that's going to keep those parasites down and allow those birds to grow and develop. When we make that transition to layer feed again at around 18 weeks, 
those birds, they're done growing, they're done developing, their immune systems are certainly much more able to tolerate and deal with those challenges. So, um, you know, it takes about four weeks for your birds to develop a natural immunity to coccidiosis. So we're just delaying when that onset is going to be. <clears throat> All right. Um, I think that about covers it for um, what we have for the organic feed. Um, you know, I see lots of, we got lots of parent. I see Jessica Nelson is a chicken parent. So way to go. She's calling it out. Um, it, she uses crumbles. Often you know, the, the young birds, the starter feeds are crumbled feeds. They're going to be smaller particle sizes for those birds to allow them um, to be <clears throat> eaten well uh, and, and not go out there. Um, right. All right, let's see. That gets us through medicated feed. So um, let's see, I think we have a quiz question coming up. Dewey, there it is. All right, get your, uh, get your fingers ready. Type in the comment section, when should chicks be fed medicated start and grow? <clears throat> or in what situation should you determine whether your birds need, what do they need to be to not be fed start and grow? I'm trying to figure out. Not when, or I guess not a date, uh, in what circumstances? So I talked about the birds, there it is. We've got it, I see we've got a couple of them. Yes, we've got some answers in there, all right. <clears throat> so, all right. So the answer, yes, when they were unvaccinated, <clears throat> that's what we want to see for those birds. If they're not vaccinated for coccidiosis, that's when uh, we would certainly consider feeding them that medicated starter feed to keep them safe um, throughout that growing part of the process. And again, you know, I, I see like Sable here is saying at the beginning, I see some other day ones. So yes, at, from start, get them on that medicated feed and keep them on medicated feed until you transition to a layer feed. Now, we don't want to kind of feed it to four or six or eight weeks and then transition them to a non-medicated feed. And I will say, um, if your birds were vaccinated for coccidiosis and you um, do feed medicated starter feed to the birds, you're actually going to kill the vaccine. And then those birds aren't going to develop that natural immunity from the vaccine. So that's why once you start feeding medicated feed, you need to continue to feed that to your birds until they transition to layer feed. <clears throat> All right. Ah, yes. So Natalia, they are, there are going to be prizes for the winners. Um, and then we will get in touch with you after this to get your information and get that stuff off to you and the other winners um, throughout the broadcast. So, all right, that's, we're going to feed the starter feed to your birds from zero to 18 weeks. 18 weeks is really when we make that transition to a layer feed. Uh, I, I did mention earlier, you can start to make that transition at 16 weeks if you need to combine flocks earlier. That's kind of the earliest that I would transition your birds from a starter feed to a layer feed because any earlier than that, we can start to run into some issues. All that extra calcium in the layer feed has to go out the bird's kidneys. Um, and, and so too much calcium too soon um, can start to do some irreparable damage to those, those kidneys and then ultimately um, leave it, uh, you know, put those birds at a disadvantage and you know, potentially shorten their lifespan um, and all sorts of bad things. So. 18 weeks is typically when we make that transition. Although if you do start seeing eggs from your birds, uh, maybe if it's 16 or 17 weeks, you can also make that transition um, to a layer feed when you start seeing eggs from those birds. We do have several options when it comes to layer feeds for your birds. So you may not need them right now, but it's always something to start thinking about kind of in the back of your mind when they do get, you know, four and a half, five months after I get my birds, I'm going to start need to, needing to think about what do I want to get out of my birds in terms of what type of eggs. You know, we've got four different options when it comes to layer feeds. Um, we have three of those that are kind of in our traditional layer uh, ingredients, feed ingredients, and then we do have organic. So if you're on that organic path, you can continue with that. We have the layer feed available and start in uh, crumbles and pellets. <clears throat> and then 
when it comes to the traditional feed, we have our Laina, which is our kind of our, our gold standard. And then we have a couple kind of variations off of Laina where we've added some things to it to kind of give it a little extra boost. Uh, one of those is called Laina Plus Free Range, where we've added black soldier fly larva into the product. So if you want your birds to have access to insect protein kind of on a daily basis or a year round basis, that feed is a great option to provide that to your birds. Um, and then we also have one called Laina Plus Omega-3, where we've added ground, we've added flaxseed <clears throat> to that product. That brings more omega-3 fatty acids into the chicken's diet. She takes those omega-3 fatty acids, she puts those into the eggs, you eat the eggs, you get more omega-3 fatty acids in your own diet. So this is a great way to kind of use your chickens to improve your own health. Uh, in there. So that's an option out there. Um, regardless of which of those four you choose, again, the nutrition is going to be the same. It's 16% protein, 3.5% calcium, vitamins, minerals, all the amino acids, all the nutrients that those birds need are in that feed. So one of them isn't necessarily a higher level of nutrition than another. Um, it's really just kind of what your goal is to get out of those birds, whether it's um, more nutrition for yourself, or maybe it's organic, you know, you kind of decide what works best for you uh, and, and your flock. Um, and, and keep in mind too, when you're looking at that, um, you know, the birds are gonna eat a decent amount of feed. So just for a point of reference, like I said earlier, you know, your adult birds are gonna eat about a quarter pound of feed a day on that. So keep in mind as you're getting that, those young birds, each of those little bitty baby birds, when you bring them home, they're probably more like this big. Um, when you bring them home, each one of those chickens in those first 18 weeks of life is going to go through about 15 to 20 pounds of feed. Uh, so keep in mind when you're out there buying those bags of feed, because we do have some small bags of feed and we do have some very large bags of feed. So um, depending on how often you want to visit your, <clears throat> your store friends, uh, keep that in mind. You know, buying a, a five or 10 pound bag of feed is certainly fine, but we do have 25 and 55 50 pound bags of feed as well. So those birds are gonna go through a lot of, of feed. They are little eating machines. <clears throat> all right. Uh, all right, that gets us through the feed. How much feed? I'll talk a little bit about roosters um, because occasionally we do get roosters in with our hens. Um, sex errors do happen. We get them by mistake. Um, we wanna make sure that we're feeding the roosters properly when we gets to um, that adult stage, uh, we want to make sure that the roosters aren't being fed layer feed all the time. Uh, roosters don't lay eggs, so they don't need all that added calcium. So really, for your roosters, they should be on flock raiser, which is a lower calcium level um, than what, um, <clears throat> what the layer feed is going to be. And that's really best for him. If you uh, really want your roosters to, to live a long, healthy life, keeping him off of layer feed is really going to be beneficial for him because again, he doesn't lay eggs. He doesn't make eggshells. He doesn't need all that added calcium um, in that, um, in, in his, in his diet. Uh, let's see. Susan has a question. When would you use medicated flock razor? So flock razor is really intended for, especially for the medicated one is really more for broiler chickens. So if you are raising meat birds, the medicated flock razor product would probably be a better option for that. Uh, starting flock razor is a 20% protein feed. That's a little higher level of uh, nutrition, a little higher than what um, your laying chickens are going to need. Start and grow is really ideal for, um, for the start for the young chickens, for the laying chickens. You can certainly feed flock razor to those young birds. Um, you know, a lot of people will feed that if they have mixed flocks. Sometimes they have chickens and ducks. Um, in their flock. And so flock raiser would be an option for that. Unfortunately, you wouldn't, you shouldn't be feeding the medicated flock raiser to ducks because medications, uh, there are not medications for ducks. So that would be the unmedicated uh, flock raiser. <clears throat> yes. Um, and then uh, scratch grains. I want to talk a little bit about scratch and treats. Um, I touched on that briefly earlier, so I won't spend too much time here. Again, Find that 90-10 rule, 90% 90 of their daily diet coming from that complete feed, the other 10% from um, other options. Um, remember, scratch grains are not a complete feed. Um, they are a treat for your chickens. They are going to love it. 
Uh, because, you know, like I've been saying repeatedly, chickens do eat to meet nutrient requirements and they're going to eat to meet their energy requirement first. And scratch grains are very high in calories. They are like a bag of candy for us. Lots of calories, not a whole lot of nutrition other than calories um, for those birds. You know, you look at layer feed, for example, it's 16% protein, 3.5% calcium. Scratch grains are going to run 8 to 10% protein and almost 0% calcium. Um, so as you feed more of that scratch to your birds, you're actually diluting out that nutrition in the feed uh, so that those birds aren't going to be laying eggs as well. Maybe their shells get thinner. So um, like I said, two, tablesp two tablespoons per chicken per day um, is, is really kind of that 10% rule for your birds. So if you're out there throwing handfuls of scratch grains or cracked corn to your birds, uh, and, and you do start to see egg production, maybe the shell quality gets thin or it's not quite what you think it should be, maybe cut back on some of those scratch grains or stop feeding scratch grains to your birds for a period of time. Give them a week or two and see if some of that drop in production shell quality doesn't start to correct itself as the birds start eating their regular feed and get the nutrition that they need to make good strong eggs um, in, in that process. <clears throat> Um, all right. Uh, and then another one, grit comes up from time to time. We'll talk about grit. Uh, grit is just a bag of gravel that you can feed your birds. It's claimed to help in digestion. It's not something that your birds really need. Um, you know, the feed that they're getting, whether it's in pellets or crumbles, um, is actually a bunch of finely ground particles that are small. They get in the gizzard those pellets and crumbles dissolve, they come apart, uh, and the birds are able to digest and absorb those nutrients without the addition of grit. Uh, people think um, chickens need grit because they don't have teeth, they don't have a way to grind those things down, and that's actually what the gizzard's job is done. It's a muscle in there, and it just kind of grinds that stuff down into smaller particles, and so making that gizzard work is actually a good thing for your chickens and grinding them down, and I will say for those of you that are probably all of you that are raising your birds on the ground. They're free ranging, they're roaming around. They're probably picking up bits and pieces of gravel from the dirt and everything else um, that they're eating. So there's really no need for you to go out there and, and buy a bag of gravel um, to give to your chickens. <clears throat> um, well, I see Jessica has a question here about warming foods in winter, corn or no corn. Uh, Jessica, again, I, Keep the feed as simple as possible. You know, you don't need to warm the food. Uh, I know there's a big myth out there of feeding them extra cracked corn to help generate body heat, which digesting feed in general, <clears throat> the act of digestion is what generates that body heat. Now, cracked corn is good. It does have a lot of energy and it has a lot of calories, which is going to generate some heat. But the problem is it's not a complete diet. So, You've taken your birds when it's cold outside and you're feeding them an incomplete diet or a diet that's not providing all the nutrients that they need. So now they might be cold stressed because it's cold outside, but now you're also not providing them a complete diet. So now they're starting to deal with some nutritional deficiencies. So now we're piling stress upon stress. So really what you're going to find is going to happen is your birds, when it does start to get cold outside, they're going to eat more feed and they're doing that so they can generate more body heat. So ideally I would say, if anything, cut back on the amount of scratch grains and treats and other things that you're feeding those birds um, during the winter months. They're just going to eat more of their regular feed to generate that body heat. And that's really going to keep them nutritionally, provide them the nutrients that they need. Because like I said, again, if you start thinking about how much cracked corn, if you're feeding them maybe 50% complete feed and 50% cracked corn, you've got 16% protein. That's what they need on a daily basis. Your corn seven and a half, eight percent. You're really cutting into that. There's not a lot of other vitamins and minerals and the other nutrients that those birds need on a daily basis. You're really doing them a disservice by overfeeding them that cracked corn. I know it's a common myth out there and it gets perpetuated out there, but it's really the one of the bad things that you can do for those birds. Just let them eat their complete feed and get the nutrition that they need on a daily basis. That's how they're going to stay warm. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Um, and then she's also asking, Natalia is asking what's best grit or oyster shell. Uh, well, grit, like I just said, is just a bag of gravel. There's no nutrition to grit. 
Um, oyster shell is a source of calcium for the birds. <clears throat> um, you're going to see calcium, they, they certainly serve two different purposes. Oyster shell is there to provide more calcium in the diet. Um, and you're going to find that in all of our layer feeds. They have our oyster strong system in there. We've actually incorporated oyster shell into the diet so that the birds are getting that larger particle oyster shell in there. So it stays in their digestive tract longer uh, and provides them a, a sustained source of calcium. So they don't have to rely on their body stores of calcium so much. So I guess if I'm picking between the two, I'm going to put oyster shell out there because grit is not, it's non-nutritional. Um, there's no nutrient value to it. Um, it's just something for them to pick up, eat, and sit in their body and pass through. The oyster shell actually provides a source of nutrition uh, for those birds. <clears throat> um, all right. Um, let's see. Let's move on to what we got next. I need to, oh, we do have a pop quiz. Another pop quiz question. All right. Get, get ready. Comments. First comment we see. What treats and supplements should baby chicks get? What did I say you should feed your baby chickens? There we go. I'm starting to see it. All right. I see that. Yes, none. We don't want any, <clears throat> any, uh, treats and scratch for those baby chickens. We want them to be eating their complete feed as much as possible. All right, so good job, everybody. Wait until those birds are around 18 weeks or so before you really start spoiling them. And, and then again, like all things, spoil your birds like you spoil yourself in moderation. You know, if we eat too much of the things we shouldn't be eating, it doesn't end well and overweight chickens fat birds don't stay healthy they don't lay eggs you know we want to keep your birds as, as healthy as possible so um great job out there <clears throat> all right um i think we've got to talk about sanitation biosecurity disease uh, you know i want to make you aware um you know you're gonna be loving your chickens out there especially you chicken parents um, but understand that chickens aren't necessarily the cleanest animal out there. Um, <clears throat> you know, we want to make sure that they're, um, uh, let's see, you know, that you're taking the steps to wash your hands. Um, you know, birds do carry salmonella, um, and, and that can be transferred to you. Um, <clears throat> you know, we want you to stay safe. The, the risk is, is pretty low. But if you've got people who are immune compromised, um, you know, you could, could run into some issues. The younger children can run into some issues um, with those chickens. So um, regardless of how clean you keep your chickens, um, you know, there's always a risk. They carry that inside. They don't show signs of illness, um, but they can carry that. Um, just, you know, be cautious. Uh, make sure you're washing your hands, you know, before and after you handle your chickens <clears throat> and that step, um, you know, and keeping your birds separated from wildlife as much as possible is always a good thing. Um, avian influenza is passed from uh, wild birds to chickens, um, and that can be a problem. Uh, you know, obviously, if you let your birds free range, there's, you know, you control what you can control. Uh, we can't keep wild birds away from them when they're out wandering around, but do what you can in your run area to close off that as much as possible so that wild animals can't get in, um, you know, especially birds because they can pass diseases and then the other larger ones who are going to make a meal out of your chickens if they can get into your coop. So uh, keep that in mind as you um, are raising those birds. Uh, and then I think the last thing I want to talk about really is kind of how long <clears throat> are you raising those birds? You know, what's your commitment with these chickens? Uh, the average lifespan of a chicken is about eight to 10 years. Um, the, um, you know, the, the record, there it is, is, is around 22 years of age. So your chickens can live for a very long time. They're not going to lay eggs. Um, for all of that period. Um, you know, like I said, most chickens 
eight to 10 years is the average lifespan. Egg production is really going to taper off at about six years of age. What you're going to find, your birds are going to start laying eggs really well at around 18 weeks of age. And they're going to lay eggs almost on a daily basis for about the first two to three years. Um, as they age, you know, they are going to slow down a little bit. You know, that first year of egg production is really going to be your best year. Every year after that, they're going to lay fewer and fewer eggs. There's going to be a little larger gap in there. Um, you know, in the first three years of life, we say egg production is really pretty good. It's roughly about that, you know, six eggs a week, kind of what to expect out of those birds. As they hit years three, four, five, and into six, that gap becomes larger and larger. Now it's every other day, maybe it's every couple of days, you know, maybe now, you know, around five, six years, seven years, maybe it's only one egg a week, or maybe it's even once a month, you know, it really tapers off <clears throat> out there. Um, so I see, uh, oh, Isabella Washington, she's got a 12 year old hen. So great job, Isabella. And Brenda's got a six year old bird. So that's great. So you're going to have these birds for a really long time, but they're not going to be laying eggs, um, for all of those times. You know, they may still lay an egg every now and then, but once they hit kind of that eight year mark, it's really, it's don't expect a whole lot of eggs. So, you know, if you into chickens and you like those eggs that you've got, Think about every two to three years, you might need to um, add some more birds if you're not already adding birds on a regular basis um, before that. <clears throat> um, and I think that's great. Uh, let's see. I thought I saw a question earlier about electrolytes in the water. Um, yeah, Charlene Perez posted that. Um, you know, electrolytes in the water is not something that's really necessary for the birds. You think, again, the feed is complete so it has all the nutrition that the birds need which includes electrolytes which are the minerals um, you're going to get that in the bird so you can actually get into a situation where if your birds are eating their feed and drinking water filled with electrolytes you can actually start to overdose them on some of those minerals and create some toxic toxicity issues for those birds so the only time i would recommend using electrolytes is if your birds are not eating their feed uh, if they're not eating feed, then they're not getting the nutrition that they need. The electrolytes are there to kind of provide some basic nutrition for those birds to kind of keep them going so that whatever is causing them to stop eating feed, if it's usually an illness, they can get through that and then back on feed and then they can start replenishing all those other nutrients. Uh, but if your birds are, a lot of times people will bring young birds home and they will put them on electrolytes, but those birds are also eating their feed and drinking those electrolytes. So. Um, no more than a few days because you can get into some toxicity issues with some of those minerals pretty fast. <clears throat> now, if your birds are eating their food, they don't need electrolytes in their water. Um, and, and think too, the, the starter feeds, the layer feeds all have prebiotics. They have probiotics in them. So they have things in that feed to keep those birds as healthy as possible, to keep that gut um, healthy and keep digestion going. So those are things that, you know, it's in the feed already. You don't need to be buying extra things to put in your feed um, because they're getting all the nutrition that's in that feed. <clears throat> uh, Lori, uh, Lori is asking about apple cider vinegar beneficial in water. Um, <clears throat> uh, there we go. So is, is apple, this is a question we get all the time. There's no science behind apple cider vinegar to say that it's good or not. Uh, it, it's one of those, it's kind of a home remedy that gets a lot of people will put it in the, um, in their water. Uh, you know, it, it really depends. There's, there's no science that says apple, adding apple cider vinegar to your water is going to make them healthier or more beneficial, but it, it's one of those things. It's kind of a no harm, no foul, if you will, um, <clears throat> that, uh, you can add it to the water. Just remember if you add too much vinegar, into the water, that's gonna keep the birds from drinking water, which is gonna be detrimental. So um, getting that kind of dosage right is, is important. Keeping that concentration of apple cider vinegar in the water fairly low is what's gonna keep those birds drinking the water. <clears throat> All right. All right, uh, and I think what, do we have one more? One more quiz question? All right. Uh, let's see. What is it? Here we go. When do chickens start laying eggs? At what age do chickens start laying eggs? <clears throat> All right. 
I see Amanda's got a question. We'll get to that after we finish up this quiz question. Oh, I see you there. There we go. <clears throat> I like that. Who put that one? I saw when they damn well feel like it. I love it. <laughs> Uh, that's great. I see lots of good questions. So typically it's around 18 weeks is when we say we're going to make that transition from into that's when they're going to start laying eggs. So, um, there you go, Teresa cross. Congratulations. Uh, and then I wanted to go back to Amanda, uh, Venturino had a question about using artificial light in the winter time. Uh, why would you choose or choose not to? Uh, so, in order to keep your birds laying eggs, so egg production is really driven by day length. So it takes about 16 to 17 hours of daylight a day to kind of keep your birds in egg production. So you're going to find that as our days are starting to get longer, this is why oftentimes we, you know, we raise birds at this time of year, <clears throat> the days are getting longer. Birds are starting to get that sign from mother nature that winter is coming to a close. So it's time to start getting back into egg production. And then, as we rotate around into the fall and those days start getting shorter. So if you're starting birds now in the spring, about the time they really hit peak production, August, September, October, um, you're gonna start to see the day length getting short. So some people will choose to add artificial light um, to their flocks to keep those birds laying eggs throughout the winter. Um, so again, keep that, set the light on a timer. So you're getting about 16 hours of day length. It doesn't take a lot of light, it's about a 25 watts of incandescent light uh, per 100 square feet. Uh, and you can use LEDs or fluorescents just to kind of dial down that wattage based on uh, whatever the incandescent equivalent would be. I think it's something like nine watts um, for a, a LED <clears throat> to get you the same amount of light. Doesn't take a lot of light. Um, so it's both artificial and natural light that will get that too. So I always recommend set the lights on a timer, have them come on in the morning have those artificial lights go off there um, and then turn off sometime during the day and let natural light kind of put your birds to bed. So um, people will, you know, use that to keep their birds laying and getting eggs throughout the winter months. Uh, for those of you that don't necessarily want to deal with eggs in the winter month, if you just leave it to natural day length, you're going to see your birds will um, certainly as they get into two and three years of age, um, your egg production is going to drop off the, um, biological drive of the birds, you know, as they hit that kind of four or five month age, just the desire of the body to make eggs may push them to keep laying eggs. But as they get older, as the day length really gets shorter, you're going to see the egg production is going to fall off pretty fast um, when that goes. So, um, you know, oftentimes people wonder if um, adding day length to their or getting the birds to lay eggs through the winter months is going to shorten their um, egg laying life. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, although it is true that birds are born with all of the egg cells, if you will, that they will ever have, uh, it, it's somewhere in the thousands, uh, five to 7,000 egg cells that they have that they can turn into eggs at some point in their life. We have to think about how long do chickens actually lay eggs? <clears throat> you know, it, they don't lay eggs for the first four and a half months of their life. Um, after that, you can get about a year, you get about 52 weeks of good solid egg production out of those birds. You know, a good egg laying chicken is going to lay 300 eggs per year. You know, if she lays 300 in the first year, she's going to lay maybe 280, 275 the second year, then it's 260, then it's 240. Every year that she lays eggs, it's fewer and fewer eggs. Uh, so even if we go with that 300 and say that she's going to lay 300 eggs every year, that's 10 years of solid egg production um, to get to 3,000 3, eggs. She's not going to lay eggs every day for 10 years. She's going to take breaks while she molts. Uh, there's various things. She, the first four and a half months of life, she doesn't lay eggs. So people are often worried that by lighting their birds and continuing to encourage them to lay eggs through the winter months that they are um, going to run out of eggs. And I, I assure you that is not the case um, if you keep your birds, um, on light throughout the winter months. <clears throat> right. 
Yes. So yeah, and you can keep those birds. And, and certainly I, I would, Amanda, um, you know, adding that light isn't going to be a big impact. And if you want to kind of maximize the number of eggs from your birds, uh, especially in that first year of life, you know, that's the problem. We start birds in the spring and then when they come into egg production, you know, September, October, whatever, and the days start getting shorter, mother nature's telling them to stop laying eggs, but their body is saying, I'm ready to go and produce as many eggs as possible. So uh, certainly you can take advantage of that first year uh, and decide whether or not you want to deal with getting eggs uh, throughout those winter months as the, as the years progress. <clears throat> so, all right. Oh, Brenda is keeping spreadsheets every year. All right, Brenda, I love data collectors. Uh, good job. Not who late, but yes. Yeah, so that's, that's a great way, you know, and if you ever want to know if something is really going on with your flock, knowing how many eggs to kind of expect on a regular basis is a good thing because if there's an illness or something's going on in that flock, egg production is going to go first. That's going to be the first thing that drops off. So if there's an illness that's going, you're going to see, you're going to go from, you know, maybe 80% production today, and you might go to 30% the next day. So egg production really drops off fast or, you know, if something's going wrong, egg production is going to be the first thing to go. So kind of knowing what to expect from your birds is always a good thing because you can pick up on um, when things might not be going right uh, in, in your flock. <clears throat> All right. Um, and then, oh, Amanda's got one more. Did I ruin their first year of egg laying by not adding light? No, it, you, you'll still get eggs out of them. Um, you know, you just may not have gotten as many eggs as you would have gotten had you kept them um, on light. So don't worry about, it. you're not spoiling them or ruining their, their future production, um, by not taking advantage of that. <clears throat> All right. What else have we got? Um, I think that about wraps up what we've got. So again, I want to thank everyone for taking time out of your day, uh, to listen to me talk about chickens. Um, if you want to find more information, we've certainly got um, pamphlets and brochures out there that have more information, go into more detail of most of the things that I've talked about today. Go to the PurinaMills.com uh, forward slash chick dash days website and you can find some great pamphlets. Go into your local Purina feed dealer <clears throat> uh, and, and you can get more information there as well. So there's lots of this information out there. Uh, it certainly goes into more detail than what we just covered in, in uh, you know, the last, I don't know, 75 minutes or so. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a good day.